BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. Today I'm going to be revisiting the case of Stephen Avery, which was made famous by the Netflix docuseries Making a Murderer. But just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. This uh, show has had some ups and downs with the schedule over the last two weeks, but normally I try to come out three times a week here on Black Box All Night Radio, talking about the Zodiac Killer on Mondays, and the Wednesday segment has mostly been devoted to the Long Island Serial Killer, but soon I will be doing a segment on Wednesdays about the Texarkana Moonlight Murders from 1946, and Friday is an Anything Goes where any subject is fair game. And for a while on the Anything Goes Friday segments, I was talking about the story of Stephen Avery making a murderer, which um, focuses on the 2005 murder of Teresa Holbach, which I'll be discussing today, and I am back in the swing of things with that now. Uh, first, I would like to give a shout-out to Jerome, the French Wrecking Crew, who introduced me to this material, and I knew a little bit about the story of Stephen Avery, mostly because people had been talking about making a murderer, and um, that he was involved with that, but I didn't really know any of the pieces of the story until Jerome recommended that I have a look and a read, and he is the French Wrecking Crew, but today I will be discussing the book Wrecking Crew by John Farrakh, and I do have to apologize immensely to John Farrakh, because I once called him John Freak. I guess I was reading a little bit too fast, I'm sure he has had heard that once or twice in his life, and on the cover of his book, it, there is the attorney, Kathleen Zellner, who represents Stephen Avery, and she becomes very involved in the Netflix docuseries, especially for the second season. But um, if you guys would like to follow along with all of these shows, I would like to drop the other announcement that this show is available for free download at Launchpad 1. There's a link to that in the description box. You can download the audio version of this show, take it on the go anywhere and anyhow. If you would like to download the video version, you can use YouTube Premium, but that you have to pay for Launchpad 1 is free. And a great way that you can support all of these efforts is to go over to the buymeacoffee.com page. If you would like to make a contribution to support the show, anything is welcome, and all contributors will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. And the absolute final announcement is that this is not going to be a traditional book review. This is just a book discussion where I'm going to be reading a book and just pulling out some ideas as opposed to strongly analyzing the format. Oh, I thought this idea could have been presented in a better way. I'll do a little bit of that, but it's not meant to follow any type of rules or guidelines. Just reading the book and looking at this idea or that one and giving a response to it. But how did Stephen Avery become the subject of the Netflix docuseries Making a Murderer? Well, to do a little bit of recapping as best as I can, as I said um, just a few moments ago, I am still a newcomer to the case, but Stephen Avery 
was arrested and convicted of a crime in the 1980s, the rape and attempted murder of a woman named Penny Bernston, and he served 18 years in prison for that, and he was exonerated because of DNA evidence, when the DNA revealed that he could not have been the attacker of Penny Bernston because it was another criminal named Gregory Allen, and I think that that is more or less an open and shut and well, um, well formed consensus that he did not commit that crime. And he had a new lease on life. He got out of prison after all of these years for a crime that he didn't commit. And most people in that situation, maybe you've seen them on the evening news, they file a lawsuit, they get a settlement for wrongful imprisonment, and they go on to live their lives doing uh, whatever they so choose. I did an episode once on this channel called Interrogation, the Murder of Dorka Lisker, where um, a man named Bruce Lisker was accused of murdering his mother. He did 26 years in prison and was um, exonerated, and he got a $7 million settlement from California. But Stephen Avery filed a $36 million lawsuit, and could that have been a motive for someone to um, bring trouble into his life. In 2005, only two years after Stephen Avery had been released from prison, a woman named Teresa Holbach went missing. Teresa Holbach was a photographer for Auto Trader, and the Avery family owned a salvage yard, and they had numerous vehicles, and Teresa was on the property to take photos of for Auto Trader, and what happened to her is still somewhat of a mystery. And the first comment that I can give about this book, Wrecking Crew, is that it just asks the question, did Stephen Avery murder Teresa Hallback? Okay, if not Stephen Avery, then who did? Because this book is taking a very persuasive stance that Stephen Avery was innocent of both of these crimes, the attempted murder of Penny Bernstein and the murder of Teresa Hallback. And I'm wanting to know the answer to that question myself, and I think that there is absolutely not a universal consensus on who should have been found guilty for the murder of Teresa Holbach. But as far as the way that crime was committed, I have a standalone episode about her called The Murder of Teresa Holbach, but they believe that multiple methods were used in her death. She, they, the authorities also believe that she was sexually assaulted, and her remains were set on fire and allegedly found in the burn pit on the Avery property where they had large fires. So I would actually like to go to a particular part of the book here, just in chapter two, and they're talking about the last time that Teresa Hallback was seen alive, and one of the first pieces of defense against the prosecution, really I should say, one of the pieces of evidence in favor of Stephen Avery's innocence is a possible eyewitness sighting. Bear in mind, this is an early part of the book, and as you see from here, this is part one, so it'll be an ongoing series. And it says, I reviewed the police report of the November 6, 2005 interview of Brian Dassey, where he said that Bobby Dassey saw Teresa Hallback leave the Avery property on October 31st of 2005. I was unaware of this report. I never tried to interview Brian Dassey about Bobby Dassey's alleged statement. I was never instructed by trial defense counsel Buting and Strong to interview Brian Dassey, Bates said. Bobby Dassey was the key prosecution witness at Stephen Avery's trial who testified that he saw Miss Hallback walk toward Mr. Avery's trailer after taking photographs of his mother Barb Janza's van. Bobby also testified that when he left the Avery salvage yard, Miss Hallback's vehicle was still on the property. Teresa Hallback drove a Toyota RAV4, and again, I'm going to try my best to articulate the prosecution's theory, and that is that Stephen Avery, along with the assistance of his nephew Brendan Dassey, murdered Teresa Holbach. They even shackled her to a bed with leg irons, sexually assaulted her. They're building the case that he had just gotten out of prison for a crime that he didn't commit, so he was untouchable and he thought that he was going to get away with it, and they attacked a woman in a vulnerable place. Both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey participated in the sexual assault of Teresa Hallback. Then they took her body, put it in her own car, a Toyota RAV4, drove it just more or less close by on the property, extremely close by actually, to the trailer where Stephen Avery lived, and her remains were set on fire in the burn pit, and then Teresa's 
Toyota RAV4 was moved to a different location on the Avery salvage yard. In short, they thought that it would just blend in with the other vehicles. But what's important is that, number one, his blood, Stephen Avery's, was found in Teresa Hallback's Toyota RAV4. And number two, a car key was found in Stephen Avery's trailer in a place where only he should have had access to, or at the very least, it's found very close to his belongings. Perhaps other people could have had access to his trailer. I mean, other residents and members of anyone who would have been going through the Avery salvage yard, but found very close to his belongings is perhaps a better way of putting it. But what did we just say here from this book? An eyewitness states that they saw Teresa leaving the Avery salvage yard. Well, that would throw a giant wrench into any type of theory involving um, her being sexually assaulted in Stephen Avery's trailer and then that whole story about disposing the remains, if that is indeed true. But there are so many conflicting reports, and it's also very, very vital to remember that Stephen Avery's nephew, Brendan Dassey, was convicted of this crime as well. He ended up confessing to being an active participant in Teresa's murder, and he will be eligible for release from prison in the year 2048. I've noticed, though, that perhaps even more people think that Brendan Dassey is innocent as opposed to Stephen Avery. And, I mean, I'm not saying Stephen Avery is guilty. I mean, lots of people think that he is innocent. But I think that there are even more people who think that Brendan Dassey was innocent and that he was duped and coerced and practically lied to, to to extract a confession out of him for something that he didn't do simply because he just wanted the interrogation process to stop. And you know, just as well as I do, that happens all the time. Even if you're not the biggest true crime follower in the world, you must have heard something about that, about how somebody confesses to a crime that they didn't commit under the uh, stress of a police interrogation and this is also something that I've shared in the past on the channel that they even instruct people when they're conducting interviews or interrogations or any type of um, discussion not to start shouting at the other person because the other person is more likely to say something that the other person is um, trying to get out of them. Like they're just going to go along with what the other person says because they can get distracted or they're more likely to just give the desired result if the other person is raising their voice after a certain level. And I know that's not going to put a ban on shouting. Absolutely not. But the whole point is people say things that they don't mean when they are under stress or when they're in the face of conflict. And um, I think that most of us understand that that is very true. But the material that I was just discussing came from Chapter 2 of the book, Wrecking Crew by John Farrakh. And in Chapter 3, there are some discussions, challenges, and I don't even know if we should use the word cross-examination, but they are trying to poke some holes in the prosecution's theory, and we're going to hear more about this witness named Bobby. But, firstly, this book heavily focuses on the activities of Kathleen Zellner, the attorney for Stephen Avery, trying to exonerate him, and it says... Kathleen Zellner now believes the murder time sequence outlined by Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz was demonstrably false. According to Zellner, the cellular tower pings off of Teresa's cell phone reveal that the auto trader photographer left Avery's around 2.35 p.m. on Halloween in 2005. And as I said, uh, Teresa Hallback was murdered in that year. So... If that's the case, if her cell phone is pinging off a tower, it is possible that somebody could have been in possession of the cell phone. I suppose anything's possible. But does that not suggest that it is consistent with the eyewitness statement that she was seen leaving the property? And that would mean that somebody had had to have murdered her elsewhere and then brought her remains back to Stephen Avery's burn pit as well as placing the items such as the key and staging the blood evidence in his car. And in the future, I'm hoping to do a full book discussion as well on Illusion of Justice by Jerry Buting, who is a defense attorney for Stephen Avery. And he brought up the theory in his book about how Stephen Avery had a cut on his hand recently because he lived more or less on an auto salvage yard, and they're interacting with a lot of 
well, a lot of things that can cut you, for lack of a better term. There are a lot of ways that someone can get a bl bloody finger on an auto salvage yard property, and that there was blood that had been dripping in the bathroom, and that somebody could have collected that blood and then redistributed it into Teresa Hallback's Toyota RAV4, even though I am mostly on the side of innocence, I find that a little bit unlikely or hard to believe, but crazier things have happened. Um, just throwing that out there, but that is from a different book. And, okay, they're trying to make the case that in a witness has seen Teresa Hallback leave Stephen Avery's property, and that her cell phone is pinged off of a tower. What happens next? From there, Teresa retraced her route of travel from Avery Road. Teresa would have turned left on State Highway 147, traveling for a mile, when she got to the intersection of Country Road, County Road Q, excuse me, County Road. Then Teresa headed south. Then she met her disaster shortly afterward, probably along the seldom-traveled Cuss Road, a spooky dead-end road covered by a dense swath of woodlands along both sides of the road. The area's general terrain includes a patch of large sand and gravel quarries along the county road, and the road is named Q, including one enormous quarry that has been around for years, a parcel owned by the Manitowoc County government. On the day of Avery's arrest, investigators Dittering and Heimerul peppered Bobby with questions about his own movements on the day Teresa met foul play. Now, I don't know again about when you left that day, they inquired. You remember what time that was? And this is uh, Bobby talking. He says, right around three o'clock. Did you see anyone when you were leaving the driveway? What? And he says, when I left? They say, yes. And then he says, no, I didn't see anyone coming up the driveway. And he says, were there any cars in the driveway? And then he says, yeah, a little SUV. And as I said, uh, Teresa Holbach drove a Toyota RAV4. Now, you told me that you were nowhere near that teal-colored SUV. He says, nope. They say, never. He says, nope. They're like, never there? And he says for a third time, never there. And then they ask Bobby, you never touched it. And he says, no again. Did you go anywhere that night after you got home from your hunting? And he says, no. You stayed home? And he says he went to work. So, I think that they are trying to persuade him to come to a similar conclusion, but they're saying that the absolute most important thing for the prosecution is this witness has now stated that, well, I'll read the question again, were there any cars in the driveway? Yeah, a little SUV, referring to Teresa Holbach's RAV4. Now, the book Wrecking Crew is taking a persuasive stance that... Stephen Avery is innocent. The subtitle is even demolishing the case against Stephen Avery. And they want to show how the timeline could have been altered during the interrogation. How exactly would that happen? He told the police that he left for work at 9.30 p.m. But he didn't go anywhere. He went to work. That is seven hours after Bobby was discreetly eyeing Teresa from inside his trailer window. And then they ask him, so what did you do when you went home? I napped. I came right home after hunting. And they say, suddenly, the interview took a change of direction. They wanted to boast about credentials. I've been in law enforcement for almost 30 years, he said, and I've done more than an interview or two, okay? And what works for me is that. I'll be honest with you. And then I find that usually people are honest in return, okay? I'm going to tell you something, okay? I can tell you that nobody from any sheriff's department planted any evidence anywhere. So that's the stance from law enforcement. Of course, they're not going to admit to planting any type of evidence. And it definitely looks like some damning evidence for Stephen Avery. But number one, Stephen Avery completely denies this. Number two, Brendan Dassey, the other participant who confessed, immediately retracted his confession as soon as the police officers were out of the room. And on the show Making a Murderer, they did a more advanced version of a lie detector, which isn't about measuring your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your galvanic skin tension. It is about looking at brain images to see 
like almost like a neurocranial transmitter, and it shows does this person have any actual memory of the events, and Stephen Avery passed that one. And again, he has maintained his innocence throughout all of this. But to talk about some new material in this book, Wrecking Crew, new for me anyway, and new for the um, this show, is this eyewitness account from not Brendan Dassey, but Bobby Dassey, is this legitimate? Because in one in variation, someone is saying that he saw Teresa leave the property. Well, I mean, that should be mostly a done deal that would completely throw out the saying about how she's being sexually assaulted on the bed and then transported in her vehicle. I mean, and it really would, because you might be thinking, oh yeah, well, she could have driven back, right? But then how would you explain the cell phone ping t pinging off the towers unless they move the cell phone? But see, already that is making assumptions. So I really would like to ask you guys, what do you think is more likely? Do you believe that an eyewitness would have um, been able to see her leave the property. And there are numerous um, motives why, about why they would want to frame Stephen Avery. Number one, they didn't want to deal with the $36 million lawsuit that had been filed. Number two, somebody else could have done it. It doesn't even have to have been law enforcement. Somebody else who had access to his um, property could have dropped Teresa's remains in the burn pit, and um, even though I think that it requires a certain degree of interpretation on making a murderer as well, Kathleen Zellner interviewed what whom someone whom she calls the foremost expert in the world on um, the cremation of human remains in in legal cases, a um, an expert witness that is, and he said that the remains were not burned in an open area such as the burn pit. They were burned in an enclosed space. Absolutely horrible when you're talking about a human being that way. But that the open air would not have produced the remains in the same way. And he has his own expert reasons for which is all a little bit over my head. But that would also suggest that he was framed. And have you ever heard the expression, though? I was just thinking about the burn pit. But you ever heard this expression? Whenever there's smoke, there's fire. And I've always hated that expression because sometimes smoke can come from dry ice. I mean, it's not real smoke, but sometimes it can come from a smoke machine. And that might not be real smoke either, but it looks like it. Absolutely. That's why I've never liked that expression. But if you are going to just use that as some type of idiom in the English language, wherever there's smoke, there's fire, there is a lot of smoke that is building up around Stephen Avery's innocence, and all of these ways in which not only the attorneys, but law enforcement are just trying to weasel their way out of these um, con contradictory statements. Like a, you have an eyewitness showing that he's leaving the property, or that she was leaving the property, and that you also have um, the forensics determining that most likely her remains weren't burned on the property, and the whole thing about the pings off the cell phone towers. And this book is um, a persuasive book. As I said, it's called Wrecking Crew, Demolishing the Case Against Stephen Avery. But so far, it's doing a pretty good job. And as I said, this is a multi-part book discussion, so this is just part one. And feel free to tune in uh, next week for part two, or if you're listening to these in a future playlist, I would also encourage you to um, keep, on, keep on going with the series. And it's also important to remember that in part one, I'm only discussing material from the first four chapters, and sometimes you have to go back and you'll say, okay, you know, this thing in uh, chapter four that I read, you know, there was, um, I, I had this really good idea, but then I learned something new later on in chapter seven or chapter eight or chapter 15. A lot of people are immediately quick to run to jump the gun and they're saying, hey, hey, how, how, how dare you say that? Yeah, that was a commonly held belief, but now it's been debunked. Well, it's an ongoing process. And as I said, part one of this book discussion on Wrecking Crew by John Farrock, demolishing the case against Stephen Avery. And if anybody has their own personal take on the subject, you can put that in the comment section down below. I've inter interacted with a lot of you guys who have just been listening to some of the other episodes about Stephen Avery and Teresa Holbach. 
And as I said, there were some other episodes outside of this new ongoing book discussion. For example, um, I have one that is simply called Was Stephen Avery Framed? I also have one called Was Brendan Dassey Framed? And as I mentioned, the um, episode The Murder of Teresa Hallback. And if you listen to anything outside of this new book discussion, I hope it's that episode The Murder of Teresa Hallback because in that one, I talk a lot more about just her as a person, and I read this article um, about what she was like before any of this happened, the activities that she was doing in daily life, and we always need to remember that uh, murder victims are so much more than that. They were people living their lives before these tragedies happened, and I was so heavily tempted to just do a, a multi-part series called just that, The Story of Teresa Hallback, Part 1, 2, and 3. And if you've listened this far into the episode, that's the true final question that I would like to ask you. Um, would you uh, like to hear a multi-part series on this, looking at it more from the perspective of Teresa Hallback, and like maybe about four or five episodes? And I was really about to start that one, but then I thought, I want to give this book, Wrecking Crew, a full solid read before I start giving in too many of my own observations and talking about some things in different directions. Okay, but uh, thank you for listening to part one of the book discussion, and I hope you'll tune in next week for part two, where people who are listening to the f in the future on the playlist can just immediately go on to the next one. Hey, lucky day, right? All right, thank you so much. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, and there is always blackboxned88 on Instagram. That's all for me now. Until next time.